We are here in Kensington. It's a suburb of Philadelphia. What you're seeing behind you are myriads of people addicted to fentanyl, addicted to Trank. We're here investigating what's happening. It is the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in my country. We have all the shocking details on the second episode of the divided states of Biden. So make sure to stay tuned. It's just devastating. We are here in Kensington. This is literally recycled Tim Pool content. And by investigating, do you mean driving past homeless people? <laughs> Sir, I don't think you know what an investigation is. Dems, imagine if Democrats went to see poverty in red states and did the same. Yeah, I, I, it's just a joke because the, the, the so-called like homeless and, and drug problem that is sweeping liberal cities, dude, it's also happening in conservative cities. There are a lot of people, okay, who are not living well in red states. The difference is you can still get a trailer park, or like, sorry, a trailer in a trailer park in like a red state, whereas that housing basically doesn't fucking exist in liberal cities. Housing in, for example, LA, it sucks ass. It, like, you want a decent apartment? Minimum two grand, minimum a month. So when people start getting into difficult financial situations, they become homeless because they ha there's no housing that's affordable, none. Whereas in red states, housing is already so cheap or like so, so much cheaper that when you lose certain income or you are fucked in this situation or this situation, at least you still have these alternatives. At least. <laughs> why does it? Why, why is Twitch fucking with me? That is. <laughs> I live in a three bedroom townhouse in South Texas and it's like $1,500 a month. That's crazy. Joseph, thank you so much for the three months. So yeah, I live in Louisiana. The housing here is fucking bad as well, TBH, but it's also insanely poor at the same time. Apartment costs have gone up $500 in three years for the average three-room apartments. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry about one fewer, so I hopped into support. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. What happened to your... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, what's happening with Twitch. I don't know. I'm going to assume that this is just a bug. This is a visual bug. I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, from my understanding, this is also happening on other people's streams as well. Other people are also getting, like, visual bugs on their viewers. <laughs> everyone, everyone fell off. Fuck. No. Oh, God. Moist criticals in one viewer, Andy. Oh, Megalon. Finally, justice has been served. I'm just kidding. Twitch. <laughs> wow. It's really actually pretty fucked right now. What happens if you go to like a category? Okay, so some people are not, some people are fine. Some people's viewership hasn't been fucked with. Seemingly, though, a lot of people. <laughs> this is really funny. One viewer. <laughs> Sorry, I'm scrolling through mine. My, my follow list. Iron Forge stream, one viewer, Omega lol, fell off. 
<laughs> oh, Megalon. Mike, 11 viewers. Omega lol fell off. <laughs> oh, God. Um, sorry, I just got here. What are we doing? Your mom. Your mom called me and wanted me to tell you that you're a wonderful person. And you should... You should know that. You should never forget that. How nice of her? I know, right? Right? Th this is a sad day in society. Housing is now unaffordable for a record half of all U.S. renters. Over the past two years, Genuine Campbell was chalked at how rent for her two-bedroom apartment in Philadelphia just kept going up from $1,300 a month to $1,600. She's a single mom of four, and right as her rent was rising... Her hours as a hotel, hotel valet were getting cut. Add in utility costs plus inflation, and every month bought a wrenching decision. Do you want to pay the bills and then give half the rent, or do you want to try and pay the whole rent and then be back on bills? Campbell says that the area isn't even safe enough for her kids to play outside, but the rent is still way out of line with what she can make. You have to work in, like, maybe a hospital or as a police officer just to keep up with the rent. In fact, how dare you? In fact... More such households and many others are now struggling to pay rent, according to a newly released report from Joint Center for Housing Studies of Harvard Academic, uh, sorry, University. It found that in 2022, as the rents spiked during COVID-19, a record half of renters paid more than 30% of their income for rent and utilities. Nearly half of those people were severely cost burdened, paying more than 50% of their income. We actually saw increases across the entire, sorry, every single income category that we look at, which sort of surprised us. Since 2019, the biggest jump in affordability, in unaffordability, was for households making $30,000 to $74,000 a year. Even among those working full-time, a third of all renters were still cost burdened. For renters making under $30,000, who already faced the most severe struggle for to afford housing, didn't think it could possibly get that much higher. But the report found it did nudge up to an all-time high of 83% who are cost burdened. She says the amount of money they have left over for all other household expenses has plummeted by nearly half to just a $300 a month. The other thing is, uh, at the, in, okay. As someone who was very poor, like bottom tier poor in the U.S., there are a lot of government programs that you can take advantage of if you live in liberal cities. I'm only going to speak on my experience living in blue state, uh, blue cities, but there are a lot of government programs that you could take advantage of. I remember I was automatically basically qualified for my utilities to be reduced by like 20 percent just because i was under the tax bracket for too rich to get this this good i also got basically full insurance coverage which is better than the coverage i have now that i, I fucking pay for which sucks <laughs> Great. Love it. Love that I pay $100 a month and yet the care is still bad. <laughs> okay. Mm. So there are like unique benefits in being under the poverty line, I guess, in the U.S. Because at least you can take advantage of a lot of the uh, means tested welfare programs that we have. Snap for my friends here in Oregon is a lifesaver. Oh, yeah. Oh, 100%. I'm in South Carolina. And I'm on food stamps trying to fight for disability. My aunt in California that made money, that made a lot of money, always had better programs than I have broke as fuck in South Carolina. Yep. And it's just that, uh, oh, look, the viewership is normal again. Uh, it's, it's quite literally just 
if you live in blue cities, <laughs> the programs are just better. They're just better. I, I remember talking to someone who lived in like Idaho or something, so a streamer friend. And I was like, they're like talking to me about not having insurance. And they're like, I don't know what to do. You know, I probably should get insurance. What do I do? <laughs> and I was like, I mean, your government, pro you guys don't have like a government program you could take advantage of like insurance. And they're like, no. I was like, are you sure? And they're like, yeah, I mean, we have one and it's dog shit. It's fucking terrible. And I'm like, oh. Oh. My insurance, my state insurance was pretty good. It wasn't great, but it was pretty good. My daughter was on ACCAS for insurance and it was fucking amazing. Practically everything was 100% covered, but now I make too much and I had to put her on my insurance plan and it really sucks. We had to change pedi pediatrics. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So. That shit sucks. It really does suck. I mean, healthcare should be free. Fucking, it's a joke that anyone has to fucking pay for it. It's, it's just stupid. It's fucking stupid. Um, I did want to say something else, though. I genuinely, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or not, but I genuinely do feel like if the housing crisis gets any worse and the shrinkflation as well as inflation, shrinkflation for anyone who doesn't know is basically you get less and pay more. So companies that used to produce uh, six ounces of bag chips are now selling a smaller five ounce bag. And visually, you can't really tell the difference. But you're getting less and they're charging you more. Here it is, shrinkflation. It's the practice of reducing the size of a product while maintaining its sticker price or making it higher mainly in food and beverage industries, to stealthily boost profit margins. It's also referred to as package downsizing in business and academic, academic research. It's basically a hidden form of inflation. Companies are aware that customers will likely spot product price increases, and so instead they opt to reduce the size of them, mindful that minimal shrinkage will probably go unnoticed. Academic research has shown that consumers are more sensitive to explicit price increases than to package downsizing, but that this practice can result in negative consumer brand perceptions and intentions to repurchase products uh, and to static or decline, declining unit uh, sales volume over time. Most people do not generally check the size of a product. Someone who loves potato chips, for example, may not realize if their favorite brand reduces the size of the potato chip bag by 5%, yet will almost certainly be able to tell if the price goes up by the same amount. Yeah. I'm sure you guys have experienced this, at least in some way. Ben and Jerry's would never. I I'm sure. I'm sure you guys have experienced this at least a little, and it's just. It's just a joke. <laughs> what do you think your ten-year-old self would think if you went back in time and told her that her job is reading Investopedia articles on camera while playing with slime? <laughs> I would not have believed you. Uh, all right, where were we? Well, why were we talking about this? Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but between shrinkflation, inflation, housing crisis, wealth gap, uh, jobs being basically unavailable because everything is being um, outsourced or becoming ghost kitchen-esque. 
why hire a whole staff when we can just hire one person to do a mediocre job because they're underpaid and overworked? Uh, so, yeah. Pretty, pretty bad. Pretty bad. I hate ghost kitchens. Sorry. There are aspects of ghost kitchens that are fine. And there are aspects of ghost kitchens that suck. I think that there's nothing wrong with having a delivery only business. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. If you don't want to have to do, I mean, that's basically like how a lot of like bakeries work or like, I don't know if you guys have seen them, but like cake shops, a lot of people who do, I feel like dessert work tend to be just like one person running a shop and they uh, have people come in and put in like custom orders and stuff. Same thing with like pizza places that only have like the delivery only. Yeah, exactly. So I don't mind the idea of a ghost kitchen. The problem for me is when some fucking massive corporation that has millions of dollars makes a bunch of ghost kitchens, fake ghost kitchens. I mean, Eddie, Eddie Burback's video on this is really good. And all of the all of the food is coming from one place. Actually, you know what? I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to pull it up. That was a good video. Wow, that is deserved. Nine million views. That is so deserved. This was a very good video. I was I was entertained the entire time, and I highly recommend you guys actually watch it. Plus, Eddie is a, a cool person. But I hate him because um, he's dating his girlfriend. How could he? I love her and I can't be with her because of him. Mm hmm. Yeah. Isn't that fucked up, guys? What a simp. Okay, and? Okay, and? <laughs> you can't com compete with that stash. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Fuck. No, it, I'm, his, his girlfriend's really cool. I mean, they're both very cool, but. Anywho. Yeah, anywho. I think she makes a guest appearance for two seconds in this video. Maybe? I don't remember. I genuinely don't remember. Because it's been so long. Okay, moving on. Let's get to this. I, I don't want to watch the whole video. No idea which two restaurants these are. <laughs> foods sorry so i won't do that you think that that covers me the, the bun feels she's perfect she just doesn't understand she needs a nice guy like me who would take care of her why do women always go for bad boys. <laughs> no, Chrissy's really cool. She's always really fun to hang out with. And she makes fucking bomb ass drinks. Yo. I don't know what magic, what type of fucking. I don't know what type of magic she'd be doing to those drinks, but the alcohol content is always high and the drinks always taste like candy. It tastes like I'm drinking juice. I don't know. She she be doing something. She be doing something different. She be doing something different. She's got cottage core. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So basically, here we go. 
He buys nine sandwiches that all look exactly the same. And they are all exactly the same. He And they're all from apparently different restaurants. Aged. I don't do as well with greasy foods, specifically something like a fish or chicken sandwich. And I can't tell you the toll that this took on my body later that day. I didn't even capture it. I was tired. Things happened in the bathroom I will never <laughs> speak of ever again. But I oh, will say man, that yeah. my opinion was these nine sandwiches tasted exactly the same I mean, to they look. me. But I think it's really important to mention that this restaurant is taking up 44 slots on delivery apps. They are competing directly with small businesses, some of which are owned by families. Now, I don't know if Chibo the restaurant owns this or if Virtual Dining Concepts bought Chibo to use their name as a brand, but would you be surprised to learn that there is another Chibo within four miles of the one that I just showed you? And together they take up 77 restaurant slots on Uber Eats. So whether or not Chibo is its own new company or just a front for virtual dining concepts, I wanna take a second to talk about VDC. Virtual Dining Concepts, or VDC, is a major ghost kitchen company. And when you go to their website, they have a collection of brands that they work with. You have Mr. Beast Burger, which we will talk about later. You have Phase Subs, which finally answers the question, can my sandwiches just be made by gamers? But as I was reading the brands, something caught my eye. NASCAR Refuel. So I clicked on it and it opened up NASCAR Refuel Wings and you can go <laughs> right to their website. So clearly NASCAR Refuel is a NASCAR themed ghost kitchen that sells primarily bone-in wings. Now if you go to the full menu, you can see that they offer five flavors. We've got barbecue, we've got honey garlic, We've got sweet chili, Cajun, and buffalo. Mmm, my tummy's already rumbling. Is that a magnitude seven earthquake in California? No, that's just my tummy for NASCAR wings. They even come in this fun little NASCAR box so you know the food's gonna get to you fast. So then I thought, you know, if VDC can let NASCAR make a unique wing place, this place can't be that bad. By the time food arrives to your table at a restaurant, you know, the people who have made the food have already jumped through a ton of hoops. The person who created the business already had the idea to create a restaurant, either paid their own money or got a loan from a bank to get the building rent. Bone-in versus boneless wings? There's no such thing as boneless wings. You know how disappointed I was to find out that boneless wings were, just meant chicken nuggets? Don't get me wrong, I like my chicken nuggies, but I'm not interested in chicken nuggets when I want bone, when I want like actual fucking wings. Don't call it a bone, a boneless wing. When it's just a chicken nuggy. That's my problem. That's what I take issue with. Bad take. Look whose taste buds haven't evolved past second grade. How does it feel? That's right. See, I have the superior palate. I can enjoy some high quality cuisine. Some Michelin star cuisine just as well as I can enjoy a nice crunch wrap supreme from Taco Bell. You like boneless pizza? Yeah, give me that shit boneless. <laughs> All right. What was I talking about? Yeah, right. Anyways, let's uh, continue going. There was something in here that I, oh, was it this part? Oh, this is the other crazy thing. 
major restaurant brands pretending to be smaller businesses on delivery apps to get more business from you. Next on our list of fake-ass restaurants, you can tell. Look at the graphics. It's obvious. Super Mega Dilla and Thrilled Cheese, those are both IHOP. Both of these have the same address and it's IHOP. What I want to know is how the fuck am I supposed to eat that as a fucking quesadilla when it's a full-blown fucking avocado and a full-blown fucking chicken tender? I can't believe that IHOP would do this. Surely no other major brands have done the exact same thing. Maggiano's Italian Classics. This comes from Chili's. It's Just Wings also comes from Chili's. Tender Shack comes from Outback Steakhouse. So I guess we have a new problem to worry about. Sometimes the virtual restaurant isn't even real, and sometimes I guess now it's Chili's. I've been researching for this video for around two months. It takes the sentence, sir, this is the Chili's, to another level. I, I missed the part that I actually wanted to show you guys, which sucks because I'm a page here. This is the part. That a pizza place that you get delivery food from and a Chinese food place that you also get delivery food from are not two separate restaurants, but one kitchen owned by the same company. But I started to wonder how common these places actually were. Could I find one near my neighborhood? And I did. I won't be showing the address, but I sat down at my computer to look at delivery apps until I found a specific address that had multiple restaurants in it. And if you look here, as I started to go through just Uber Eats as an app. I started to find that this address had a lot of restaurants in it. If I were to ask you what you thought a lot of restaurants running out of one kitchen would be, it kind of depends on how familiar you are with ghost kitchens and virtual restaurants. So you might be thinking, I don't know, two is a lot of restaurants potentially four. Could it be like five or six? So I counted the individual restaurants on Uber Eats that came up for this specific address. And I found 10 restaurants running out of the same kitchen. Does that sound like a lot of kitchens to you? Because if it doesn't, I lied. There are 20 <laughs> restaurants running out of this one location. And if you're thinking to yourself, that's not that many. I lied again. <laughs> there are 30 restaurants running out of this single location. And one final time, I lied again. There are 44 restaurants. Stop lying to me. Eats that all share Stop this it. one address. And you have food places ranging in completely different cultures and food types. There's a dim sum place, there's a curry place, there's burger places, pasta places, pizza places, chicken and waffles, a taco bars. places. Keep going. This was actually discovered by my girlfriend, Chrissy. She started looking at individual menus in this one location and finding that some of the items looked really similar. So I picked a random item from one of the restaurants that was featured here. It's a restaurant called The Codfather, and I found a beer-battered cod sandwich for $16.95. And right here it says in the description, it is a beer-battered North Atlantic cod, slaw, red and white cabbage, lemon herb aioli, and a brioche bun. So I looked at another obvious choice at the same address, at uh, Sunset Beach Fish and Chips. And would you look at that? There's a beer battered cod sandwich for $16.95. That is a beer battered North Atlantic cod, slaw, red and white cabbage, lemon herb aioli, and a brioche bun. Interesting. Two separate restaurants on Uber Eats appearing to be completely separate businesses selling the same item with the same description for the same price. So I looked at another place that had a beer battered cod for $16.95, same description. And I looked at another place and another place and another place until I had filled up my cart with not. Also, it's going to get worse because people have already started using AI photos of food instead of actually taking the photos themselves. Nine identical beer battered cod sandwiches, and I'm going to go with Chrissy to pick it up at the same exact location. That's right, we're gonna drive to one kitchen to pick up the same sandwich from nine separate restaurants. By the way, the sandwich is $16.95 for just the sandwich. So I'm about to pay, what's that times nine? I'm not, I'm gonna do it in a calculator. You can't force me to do math off the top of my head. I could have done it now, but I need to find my phone. All right, so if I just do the quick math on here before fees are involved, I will All be right, paying something's in my just eye. 
$152.55 to potentially try the same sandwich nine times. <sighs> So Chris, okay. Meets, no, employee, same bag. Is that a, like the order? Kind of makes it obvious what I'm doing. So I walked up to him and said, "Hi, we're picking up for like nine orders under Eddie." And the guy was like, "Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, do you want me to put it all in one bag? Is that okay?" So we waited for a little bit. Here's us <laughs> waving, just in case uh, we're saying hello to you specifically. Watching, we're waving me? to you. And then finally, we got the order. So I got oh, these guys. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed so casual. They did not care that we ordered from nine different places and it was the exact same one. So we drove back, bags And then spoiler in hand, alert. Left the last. The burgers, or sorry, the sandwich was all the same. That was a really long segment. I didn't mean it to go that long, but that's what, that's, this is the, this is what I have issue with when it comes to uh, ghost kitchens. I don't have a problem with a kitchen that has delivery only. That's fine with me. That, that feels fine. It feels fine to me to have a kitchen that just like doesn't want to have to deal with people sitting in and i mean like we enjoy that service in other ways as well right or, or excuse me there are lots of other businesses that already kind of do this i don't have a problem with them doing it i don't, I don't have a problem with with that aspect of ghost kitchens there's a there's a cheesecake shop in la and these are these are like bomb ass these are the bomb the most bomb ass fucking cheesecake slices you'll ever get and it is essentially whatever type of guy comes up in your brain when you think of someone that comes from california the guy you know the one that comes up in your brain he's that guy wait no what the fuck you guys not have like an image of like a californian in your head like very chill likes being by the beach you know Stick it to the man. But now nah, we're chilling, bro. We're vibing. Yeah, we're vibing. <laughs> you get me? Has a lot of opinions, but is chill. That's this guy. That's this guy. And his, his whole... The existence of his cheesecake shop, which has been open for, I think he said, like two decades or something... He's like, yeah, you know, I just, I was like talking with him because he's super friendly and he just like wants to talk. And I'm like, oh, you know, like, yeah, can I get one of these, one of these, one of these? And like the cheesecake flavors are crazy. It's like apple pie cheesecake, like Reese's cup cheesecake, which that one's not that crazy. That one's not that crazy. He had like <laughs> not Fanta, but like a soda flavored cheesecake. Like, he had a half brownie, like, half cheesecake thing. And and it was, like, incorporated well. And all of the cheesecakes are good. The problem with most cheesecake, I'm a little bit particular about my cheesecake. Because, in my opinion, bad cheesecake is terrible. It's just, it's so sweet. And it sticks to the top, like, the roof of your mouth. That it's it's kind of brutal to eat when you're eating too much of it. His cheesecake is so smooth and it's not too sweet. It's still sweet, but it's not too sweet. And there's almost like a very like dry and hard texture when you get cheesecake at the store. But this cheesecake place, oh my. Oh my God. Yeah, it's called Rocco's Cheesecake. It's in, um, I think it's in Santa Monica. But I don't eat cheesecake very often, but but when I do, I'm going to get good cheesecake. I'm not going to have bad cheesecake. I hate eating bad cheesecake. It's, it's gross. Now, raffle ticket. Thank you. You get it. It's just, it's, I'm, I'm not, I'm really not a picky eater. I just don't like store cheesecake. I'm down to eat store cupcakes and store cake and a bunch of other stuff, but I, mid cheesecake is just blech. blech. Anywho, this guy, this guy, he makes the most bomb ass fucking cheesecakes. And I go in there and I like, I want to buy a bunch of them, treat myself. I think it was like my birthday or something. And he's like, 
like it's a very small little shop you can tell it's older and he's got a sign on the cash register that says credit card companies are currently fucking me i think with it censored out so i would prefer cash over card <laughs> <laughs> and like when i'm talking to the guy he's just like yeah i don't know why they're passing it's all good i'm like oh you know like what, what are you doing here and he's like well you know i wanted to i wanted to make cheesecakes and i realized i could make cheesecakes better than anyone else can and i want to make some fun cheesecakes so sometimes i'll have an idea and i'll be like well, maybe this cheesecake idea will work and then i try it out and it tastes great and people love it so yeah, whenever I... Yeah, he's very similar to the dude in whatever that movie is called, Big Lebowski. That's, that's like the type of guy. That's what I mean when I say a Californian. That type of guy. And he just... Mans just wants to create some, some cheesecakes. He just wants to make... He just wants to make different flavors. He wants to make weird flavors. He wants to make wacky ones. Like, he's living well. He's living very well. God bless him. Hope he's doing well. Um, <laughs> cheesecake autism stuff. <laughs> Can I just say, I really am happy that we've normalized the word autism as much as we have. Because it used to be the case that say, even saying autism was like, <gasps> you, can't, you can't say that. Or if you, if you said like, oh, this is fucking autism behavior, it was always offensive, but now it's almost endearing. Like we describe people we like with the term, which is cool. So, so the, in, but that guy, he does not do like, he does not have seating. I think he has, like, one table. But he doesn't, like, have servers. He doesn't have chefs. It's literally just all him. He is the whole shop. When he feels like going home, he goes home. And when he wants to show up and make cakes and you want to buy them, you can come buy them. And you can put in special orders if you, if you want something. Like, if you want a whole one or you want a specific flavor that he made. That is, in my opinion, not very different from one ghost kitchen just running the one kitchen. If you want to run, like, a Thai food kitchen and you don't want to have to deal with customers all the time, you just want to make the food and that's all you want to worry about, and you hire a delivery driver, and, you know, you, you have all the regulations and stuff, you're fucking, you get the food inspectors over and all that other stuff. Great. That sounds wonderful. There's no problem with that at all. That's like, that sounds like you want to actually enjoy being a cook or a chef because I'm sorry, there's not a single line cook that I know that isn't this close all the time, all the time. So if that's what you want to do, yeah, that's, a, that aspect of ghost kitchens is fine. I think us being like, no, we have to do something about servers. No, no, no. I don't think that that's realistic. I think that that's silly you have to accept that some people are not going to want to have to do service. Okay? Running 40 kitchens out of one kitchen is unacceptable. Unacceptable. Like, I just, I, I... <laughs> That just feels wrong. I was a long loop. Okay, the reason why I was a long loop, I just want to say one thing. The reason why I was a long loop. Yeah, his website, by the way, this cheesecake place, his website is, um, it looks like it was made in 2008. And he hasn't changed it since. It's great. I love it. I love it so much. God bless this man. <laughs> God, can I show you guys, please? Can I show you all? It's so amazing. I love him. I love him so much. I hope I hope he's always doing well. I hope he gets business because I'm shouting this out. If anyone here is in California and you like cheesecake, don't tell don't don't talk about me. But you want to support you want to support a good business. This is it. 
This is a good business right here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Font that's barely readable. Yes. <laughs> This is what I like to do. This is what I like to see. This is this one I also really like. On the left, this says some flavors for you, but it's spelled S-U-M. When you order from us, know you'll be enjoying a quality dessert that we've created fresh and handcrafted especially for you. Oh my God. God bless him. And then here are like the flavors. When I told you guys the flavors were crazy, they were crazy. Here, let me read some of these out. <clears throat> pineapple coconut strawberry swirl mint and chip lemon chiffon chocolate marble cookies and cream low-key lime fudge brownie caramel almond chocolate peanut butter triple chocolate white chocolate raspberry green tea and honey Red velvet cheesecake, tiramisu cheesecake, guava cheesecake. <laughs> He's got a horchata cheesecake. Like, he had an, oh my God, I cannot believe he had an ube flan at one point and I haven't had it. I'm, I'm, I'm such a slut for some ube. I'm not going to lie. I'll be real with you guys. And you want to know the fucked up thing? Out of all of the ones that I've gotten, only one of them has been mm, mediocre. And I still ate all of it. And the rest of them were all great. Which is crazy. It's crazy. Because usually when you start putting flavors like this, it's not going to taste good. I've tried... Um, I think the strawberry, it was very standard. It was good. I, I tried the classic and like the, the New York style or whatever. The tiramisu one went so hard. And the fudge brownie one went so hard. It was so good. It was fucked up. And the red velvet cheesecake one went so hard. It was not okay. He has a baklava cheesecake. And it's so light and rich, which is something that is very hard to get out of normal cheesecake in most places. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Have you ever had an opera cake before? Promise it isn't about the web browser. <laughs> Anyone not using Chrome? <laughs> Can I tell you about my browser? <laughs> no. Wait. I've Okay, so I worked in a bakery for a little bit. Not as like a chef, but just like a sales person. And I was allowed to take home a lot of desserts because after a dessert stays on the shelf for two days, they're just going to throw them out. And so I would take home a bunch of stuff all the time. So I've probably had this before. It looks like I've had it. And if this is what I think it is, this shit is fucking... Oh, it's fire. Just so you guys can get an idea. Tell me this wouldn't taste amazing. You can tell just by looking that it's going to be good. I gained five pounds looking at this image. With a cup of coffee. Oh, this would go so... I'm Normally, I go for teas, but this would go so much better with coffee. I feel like chocolate just goes so well with coffee. And then if you're doing vanilla or anything else, you got to pair it with tea. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm making you guys hungry. I'm making myself hungry. And all I have is this shitty soil. <laughs> all right, enough, enough, enough. So all of this to circle back. Between shrinkflation, ghost kitchens, income inequality, fucking job insecurity rising taxes, all of these things. It would not surprise me if in like, if nothing improves in the next 
like five, ten years, if that people will start fucking rioting. Because when when you see one person in your neighborhood not doing well, let's say you live in like a 500 person town and there's one guy that isn't doing well. He's like an alcoholic and he's homeless and nobody kind of wants to deal with him. It's like, oh, well, that's that's on him. And then when it's like 10 people, it's like, oh, maybe we have a little bit of a problem, but I think we it's not a big deal. And then when you have like half of the people in your 500 person town having job insecurity and not and being homeless living through living in their car basically i think people start to look around and see that most of the people they know are not doing well Yeah, when you see <laughs> that your life is shit and the cost of everything is rising and your income is stagnating. I'm at that point with gas pumps that play ads, not just ads for the store, but like GMC or Apple products. Christ. Yeah, I know that this was kind of a bit of a a bit of the goal of Occupy Wall Street. It's been a long time since I've touched that meme. But from my understanding, it fell apart because of some stupid stuff. I haven't looked into it since the initial happening. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we get more of this. They went too anarchist with it, mostly. The anarchists in here are going to eat you alive. <laughs> uh, they just, it, it's just... I just don't believe it. I just don't. I, on principle, I don't believe that you can see yourself and everyone around you suffering and, re, and, and not realize that your government has failed you. Especially when you look at the television or the internet and you see other people aren't living like this. That people working in fucking Germany or fucking Sweden or some shit are not living paycheck to paycheck. Are not having these insane... Con living conditions, people who have actual health insurance.